So we've been uh, engaging in a study of angels. And uh, uh, we've been studying, first we looked at the nature of, of uh, God, his omniscience, his om omnipresence, and his omnipotence. And then we looked at the, the nature of angels last week and discussed about uh, uh, angels having superhuman knowledge. They, ha they, were, they were informed, they, they gave prophecies to, to Daniel, to, to uh, uh, the other prophets. Uh, they informed uh, Zacharias about his having a son that would be named John. He, he informed, of course, Mary that she was to have a child. And, and, so they, they, and they also informed Joseph to, to run away to Egypt because the king was going to try to slaughter his son. Okay. And as we were well aware of how Herod had called for the death of all the children two years and under in Bethlehem. And uh, so the angels had superhuman knowledge. They had uh, superior knowledge that of humans. Um, but yet they don't know, they didn't know, they don't know everything, as we see in Matthew 24, 36. Jesus telling his disciples about the day, that day and that hour knoweth no man, speaking about his return, the second coming when the day of judgment would be. He says, no man knoweth the hour, no, not even the Son of Man. So at that time, Jesus didn't even know when he would be returning, and certainly not the angels, not even the angels knew or will know the time when Christ, presently know the, the time when Christ will return. We also have angels that have superhuman mobility. We discussed how last week in Daniel chapter 9, where as soon as Daniel became, began praying, he was informed to go, Gabriel was told to go and meet Daniel. And so he, Gabriel took off right away, and it took him some time to get there. As rapidly as he, as he traveled, you know, um, it took him time to do so. We also we look at Revelation 14, 6. John saw an angel flying in mid-heaven. So the angels had, had really superior mobility over, over mankind. But yet, be, it does take them time to get somewhere. They're not all places everywhere. They differ from God in that respect. Just as we can't be in two places at the same time, neither can angels. Okay. Um, and today we want to pick up where angels have superhuman power. But they're not, they are not omnipotent, like God is omnipotent, all powerful. So look at Genesis chapter 19. I have a question. Yes. Uh, I think the Bible teaches, and I've studied this once before, and there are very scholarly ladies, uh, that angels, there are angels that are interesting to us today. Actually, we don't know how, and we obviously we can't see them, but there are angels that are for us today interesting to us. I'm not saying, I'm not saying that I think we have a Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, tonight we'll uh, look at tonight. I'll be preaching on Matthew chapter 18, where make, Jesus makes a statement, a statement that they're the talking about the children that their angels do always uh, do always uh, uh, behold uh, the the face of God in heaven. Okay. So it discussed about, well, what about, uh, and that really isn't regarding guardian angels. That's just talking about angels. We'll discuss uh, in this study about the role of angels, why they were created, and what their purpose is. <laughs> Think about the, the, the utility of angels. That's not really, uh, angels are, of course, ministers of God. And we'll look at that brief, briefly tonight. But uh, as far as, Angels, we know from last week, the angels were certainly interested in God's plan of salvation. They diligently, they were, they wanted to, to look into uh, the revelation that they were given. You know, uh, once again, back in Hebrews chapter one, um, The Hebrews writer is discussing the superiority of Christ to all things. And he makes comments in comparison to that of angels. Uh, in verse 4, Hebrews 1 4, being made so much better than the angels, by speaking of Christ, as he hath by inherited, inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Which of the angels did he say that? Well, none. 
So he, you see that Jesus is taking on a, preem, a position of preeminence among all beings above the angels as well. Uh, verse 6, and again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he says, and let all the angels of God worship him. So he said he's establishing that Christ is superior and a much higher preeminent position than, than even the angels. Of course, we understand that God, Jesus is God from John chapter 1. Remember, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And we see that from the following verses, that all things that were created were created by him, for him, through him. Okay. And so that, yes, Jesus is God. Um, um, in verse 7, And of the angels he saith, Who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire? But in the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is, by, is the scepter of thy kingdom. So further promoting... The, uh, uh, Reinforcing that Jesus is above all. Now, uh, look at uh, verse 13. But to which of the angels said he at any time, Sit on my right hand until I make thine enemies of thy footstool? Well, none. It's, it's showing that God has set Christ above. Now, look at verse 14. Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation? That's a very interesting statement that, that is made right there. Our, what is their purpose? We see that as we see here, the angels were, were intended, they are ministers of the Lord God. Now, it's important to understand, they are ministers of God. They are not at our beck and call. They do God's will, not ours. Okay. And that's, that's important to remember, when people talk about guardian angels, they're all at my beck and call. They keep me safe. Well, that's not at all what this discusses. This is not talking about angels are at your service to make sure you don't fall off a cliff or drive into a, sign, a, a, a signpost or anything like that. That's not what he's talking about at all. This is angels are for God's purpose in ministering as ministering spirits, and they're sent forth to minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. Okay, well, we are heirs of salvation. But as you consider, the angels did do so, like when angel Gabriel was sent to, talk, to reveal to Daniel the future. He's a ministering spirit, revealing to Daniel, thereby indirectly ministering to us so we can learn the truth. And we can learn so much from that simple, I say simple, it was rather complex revelation to Daniel. But rather, uh, we see that through the providence of God, things happen according to his will. Okay. Um, now, so, but the, the question comes, okay, what about today? Of course, we know that angels still are. They, are. they are everlasting beings like we are everlasting beings. We're not eternal beings. God is eternal. He has no beginning. He has no end. He ever is. We have a beginning and a point in time. But our spirits have no end. Say, so that, I mean... So when we think about the final day of judgment and the, the sheep will be separated from the goats and that those who will be resurrected under resurrection of life shall receive, inherit a kingdom that has been prepared for them from the foundations of the world and they'll spend eternity with, with God and our, and our Savior, Jesus Christ. But those who under resurrection of judgment, condemnation, their spirits will endure forever, but they will be they will experience the set, what the Bible calls the second death. That's total separation from all good things. Total separation from God completely. Right now we receive blessings from God, whether we're evil or whether we're good. God blesses the evil with the good through the rain, all the resources that are, he made available to us from the beginning of the world. Uh, and he, he provides for all of us, and he loves all of us, and that's why he wants us all to hear the gospel and, and, and to, be, and to uh, be affected by it and to come to him, okay? Because he wants to save us. That's his desire. So, but we are everlasting beings, not eternal, but everlasting. And the angels also, we'll look at that too. There was a point where the angels were created. Uh, we may get that to that this morning. Okay. Um, so uh, is that a satisfactory comment, Becky, to... to uh, Discussing about what, what you uh, talked about? I need to do some more study. Okay. Okay. 
we'll discuss other things. And yeah, I, I encourage questions. I might not have the answer be prepared particularly, but I'll certainly work to answer the questions regarding angels today. And that's, that's uh, an important, um, as the scriptures reveal to us, the secret things belong to God, but that which he's revealed to us belong to us. So whatever we can glean from the scriptures regarding angels, that's what he's revealed to us, that, he, that we can use for our understanding. Okay, that, that's, that's the whole purpose. Okay, so as you look at Genesis chapter 19, you recall in Sodom and Gomorrah, when uh, uh, Lot was being warned about to leave the city uh, be, because they were going to destroy it, you recall what happened there. Uh, you know, when, when, as a young person, when you're studying the stories that are in the Old Testament, I think it's really important that young people learn these stories. When I say stories, they are not, they are not myths or legends. Rather, these are accounts of events that took place. They're historic. Okay. And so I think it's important to learn these so as you grow older, there comes a point to which you start to study what these mean. And so as, as a young person learning these stories, well, certain aspects escaped me as a young person. Okay. Like this, as we learned of what happened there in um, that when the angels came and the lot finally persuaded them to stay with him because he knew the dangers that were out on the street. See, the angels were going to stay out on the street that night. And Lot persuaded him to no, come inside because he knew the dangers of that city. He was vexed night and day by the things that were going on in that city. And so uh, <clears throat> as, they, as the men, all the men came to uh, Lot that night. And we see in, in verse 5, as, after surrounding his house, and they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. That's how wicked that city was. They were so perverse. They wanted to have sexual relations with these angels. Okay. And, and Lot understood this. In fact, uh, he offered his own daughters, but they wouldn't have that. So as they pressed on the door, they were pressing to, to uh, they were going to come in, take these angels by force. Um, and we see in verse, uh, look at verse 9. And they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came to, into sojourn, and he still, and he will needs to be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them? And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. Now look at verse 10. But the men put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness both small and great, so that they worried themselves to find the door. These, these angels that had come to warn Lot, they pulled them in and they made all the men blind. They smote them all blind. Superhuman power. None of us can do that. But they, they did so, and so they were blinded by this. As an example of the superhuman power that angels had, look at sec, uh, Samuel chapter 24. Samuel 24. Second Samuel 24. Begin, the first part of chapter 24, um, wait a minute, I said 2 Samuel, oh, 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 I think it's uh, 1 Samuel 24, I'm sorry. Seventy thousand, yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, I'm looking for the, okay. I haven't, I, my reference is all wrong. Maybe it is, okay, okay, 2 Samuel 24. It's got to be. Yeah. Okay, 15 through 17. All right, so. David had, in the beginning part of chapter 24, uh, says in verse 1, And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. For the king said to Joab, the captain of the host, which was with him, Go now through all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba, and number ye, ye the people, that I may know the number of people. Well, this, this God didn't like this. Okay. So as, as a... Look at verse, uh, verse 10. And David's heart smote him after he had numbered the people. And David said unto the Lord, I have sinned greatly in that I have done. And now I beseech thee, O Lord, take away the iniquity of thy servant, for I have done very foolishly. For when David was up in the morning, the word of the Lord came unto the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and say unto David, Thus saith the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them that I may do it unto thee. So there was a price to be paid for what David had done in numbering this. It displeased God. So David was going to have, have to choose one of three things of the options that God was going to give him. In verse 13, so Gad came, came to David, told him, he said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in thy land? Number one. Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies while they pursue thee? Number two. Or number three, or that there be three days pestilence in thy land. Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. Of course, he's speaking for the Lord. And there's to be a price paid. So, David, you choose what your punishment is going to be. Of course, David's punishment is Israel's punishment. Look at verse 14. And David said unto Gad, I am in great strait. Let us, fit, uh, let us fall now into the hand of the Lord. For his mercies are great, and let me not fall into the hand of man. <laughs> so the Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel from the morning, even to the time appointed. And there died of the people from Dan, even to Beersheba, 70,000 men. Dan is in the north. That's a, it's a city in the north. And Beersheba is a far southern city. So from the northern part of Israel to the southern part, the entire land, a pestilence came upon them. Uh, from band and 70,000 men. Verse 16, And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it, the Lord repented him of the evil, and he said to the angel that destroyed the people, It's enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Ab Abrana, the Jebusite. So, because of David's foolish choice to number the people, God was angry with him. With him. There was, David was allowed to make a choice and rather than being pursued by his enemies, he chose to let the hand of God take care of it. And so God chose pestilence. And so from Dan to Beersheba, this angel brought pestilence and killed 70,000 people with it. So that's powerful. It's very powerful. What human can do that? Oh, yeah, we're familiar with our, our, our uh, uh, caustic gases, you know, gas war. Uh, uh, gas warfare and stuff like that. And we're, but, but this was an entire land, particularly at this time, that they certainly had no power like that. But look, when he got to Jerusalem, what happened? The Lord repented himself. Okay, he says, that's enough. And he stopped the angel from proceeding to Jerusalem. The Lord repented of the evil and said to the angel, that destroyed the people. It is enough. Stay now thine hand. And the angel of the Lord was by the threshing place of Ab Abrana and Jebusite. And David spake unto the Lord that he saw the angel that smote the people and said, Lo, I have sinned and I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let thine hand, I pray thee, be against me and against my father's house. Okay. But so we see that as powerful as this angel was to destroy so many people, and yet the limitation was the authority of God. The angel was, had this power up to the point where God said it's enough. And so the angel, in obedience and submission to the will of the Lord, to God, stopped. Okay, so we talk about the, the uh, uh, 
uh, omnipotence of, of God, and you compare that with the powerful yet limited power of angels. Okay. Uh, look at Second uh, Kings chapter 19. Second Kings 19. This is what I thought I was looking for at the time, but Second Kings 19 and uh, uh, verses 35 and 36 particularly. The Assyrians were coming up against Jerusalem. And Hezekiah was shaking in his boots. You didn't know Hezekiah wore boots, did you? No. Hezekiah was concerned that the Assyrians were a world power. And more than that, they were very fierce people. They were very fierce warriors. That when whomever they conquered, they were very cruel to. And so when people were being attacked by the Assyrians, they really did shake in their boots. I'm, well... They really were fearful. They feared for not only their own lives, but out of their whole population because uh, um, they were so cruel to them. It was some, so many things that were unspeakable, the things they would do to their, the people they conquered. And they were mighty. They were unstoppable for the most part. So as they were coming to Jerusalem, Hezekiah was afraid, rightly so. And... Uh, as it was, um, look at verse 15. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear, and hear, upon, open, Lord, thine eyes. And see and hear the words of Sennacherib, which has sent him to reproach the living God. Sennacherib was the general that was leading the Assyrian army. Of a truth, Lord, the, king of, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands, and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. It's very interesting. Hezekiah was, wasn't, he was one of the good kings, but he was not such a great guy. Okay? But here he was humbling himself before God, and he was saying, save us, but save us for your purpose. That as the world sees the Assyrians come down, and no doubt, if they invade us and they destroy us, they'll burn everything and they'll, they'll lay waste to everything. And what would it be the reputation? What will go out among all the world? There are, the one true living God is no God. So he's saying, save us for your sake. Okay. And verse 20, Then has Isaiah the son of Amos sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. Isn't that interesting how the, the contrite heart petitions God, and he hears that, that one that prays in such a manner? If you read about Hezekiah, he wasn't that great of a man. He was one of the good king, better kings in, in um, Judah. Israel, the northern kingdom of Israel, had no good kings. They were all evil. At least the southern kingdom of Judah had some good kings, and Hezekiah was one of them. But um, as it was, uh, as it is, and no, no man is, uh, no person is good. You know, when Jesus was, was uh, approached by this, this young ruler, he said, good teacher. And Jesus responds, what do you mean, who, who's good? There's only one good, and that's God. So it's a matter of perspective. As, as so we see that Hezekiah humbling himself like he did, and the Lord has heard his, his petition. Verse 21, this is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, hath despised thee, and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice, and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? By thy messengers thou hast reproached the Lord, and hast said, With the multitude of my chariots I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice fit trees thereof, and I will enter to the lodgings of his borders, and into the forest of Carmel. This is Sennacherib. 
That's how proud he was. He knew he could do it. It was a piece of cake. It was a foregone conclusion that wherever Snacker did would lead his army, they would find victory, defeat, conquer whoever they, they went up against. Uh, in verse 24, I have digged and drunk strange waters, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of the besieged places. You know, when you, when you march around a large army, it requires a lot of resources. You know, part of the, one of the biggest problems in a, in a large army, resources. Water. What do you need to do for all your troops? You have to supply food, you have to eat, you have to supply water just to, to hydrate them. Um, that's uh, one of the biggest killers of, a, of, a, of, a, of an army isn't battle. One of the biggest killers of an army is the logistics, disease, not getting the right nutrition. So, so when they would march around, they'd live off the land. They'd live off of whatever, wherever they went, whatever resources they found, people's farms and ranches, that's what they took from. And so as as Sennacherib was, was, was so proud of himself, what did they do? I have digged and drunk strange waters, and with the sole of my feet I have dried up all the rivers of, of besieged places. That's what they did. They, they just used it all up. Hast thou not heard long ago how I've done it, and of ancient times that I have formed it? Now have I brought it to pass that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into ruinous heaps. To all your fortified cities, I'm going to lay it waste. That's Sennacherib's idea. Verse 26, therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded. They were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and even as corn blasted before it, before it be grown up. There, he was just marching through, laying waste to everything, and no people could do anything about it. They were at his, um, uh, they were at his mercies, basically. Of course, he had no mercy. Verse 27, but I know thy abode, and thy going out, and thy coming in, and thy rage against me, because thy rage against me, and thy tumult has come up into mine ears, and therefore I will put my hook in thy nose, and my bridle in my lips, and thy lips, and I will turn thee back to the, by the way which thou camest. So God is ta telling Sennacherib what he's going to do to him. He's going to put a ring in his nose and lead him around. Sennacherib, the mighty general of that mighty army of Assyria, God is going to lean him around by the ring of his nose. Okay. God is aware of the, his nature. And because of his rage against the one and true living God, God is going to, is going to uh, put a hook in his nose and bridle in his lips and will turn him back by the way which he came. In verse 29, And this shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves. And in the second year, that which springeth of the same. And in the third year, sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root upward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. So they're going to spring up again. They're going to flourish again. Verse 32, Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, He shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a, a bank against it. So he's not going to be able to besiege the city at all. He's not going to come close enough. Of course, this must be comforting, Hezekiah. I'm not, going to have to, I'm not going to even have to send my armies out to fight him. I'm not going to, um, and so God is going to fight my battle, basically. Um, by the way that he came, by the same shall he return and shall not come into this city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for mine own sake, and for my servant David's sake. There's a lesson there. I didn't even mean to get into that. But you know, think about that. As Christians, we enjoy such a great, favorable position. We enjoy such favor from, our, from the God of heaven. Of course, we know that all spiritual blessings are found in him, in, in, our, in our Savior, Jesus Christ. The fact that, that uh, here was God is our rock. He hides our soul in the cleft of his rock. Our soul is safe. Okay? Now, I'm not saying that this is teaching us that whatever we do, that God will fight our battles and, and take care of us. No, you'll, you realize that Christians come under fierce 
uh, persecution has in the past. And bad things happen to good people, bad things happen to Christians. And things that Christians can't control. Christians have lost their lives because of, of bad people. Lost their lives because of their faith in Christ. Okay. So, but the fact is that, that our souls are safe in Christ and in God. Okay. But as, as it is here in this event, God was going to, to save Hezekiah, to save Jerusalem, and that Sennacherib would not even be able to come close to the city. Look at verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out and smote in, uh, smote in the camp of the Assyrians an hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. 185,000 Assyrian men of war. And when they arose early in the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. So when all those men got up, they found out they were dead. When it was time to wake up, they saw 185,000 other men were dead. So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed and went and returned and dwelt in Nineveh. That was the capital city of Assyria. Okay, that great city, Nineveh. You recall Jonah. Jonah was sent to declare to the, to, uh, the Ninevites, that the Assyrians, about the, the coming judgment upon their city, except they repent. Well, they did repent. But anyway, we see here that Sennacherib went, ran home with the tail between his legs back, back home to Nineveh. And it came to pass as he has, was worshiping in the house of Nisroch, his god, that Adram, Ad, Adramelech and Sherezer, his son, smote him with the sword, and he escaped into the land of Armenia. And Esarhaddon, uh, his son, reigned in his stead. So Sennacherib never got a chance to go down and defeat Jerusalem. He was killed. Okay, now here's the thing. How powerful was this angel to smote 185,000 of those men, and they can't do anything about it? So we see the um. I say not omnipotence, but the superhuman power beyond anything we can imagine. Well, that this, this angel did. Who can defeat an angel? We can't fight an angel. We don't have the power, the, the ability, and so we're, we're helpless. Much like those Israelites, Israelites were helpless before the Assyrian army. So we can see that, that uh, we can see the, the powerfulness of the angel. Okay, once again, going back to the previous passage about uh, the power of the angel to smote so many, but yet his power is limited by the authority of God. Look at Daniel chapter 6, verse 22. Daniel 6, you recall that Daniel would not succumb to the demands of, of the king. He would continue to to pray to God, make his petitions known to God. And he did so in a way that was apparent. He didn't hide the fact that he prayed. He did every day. In fact, when it, when it became illegal, what did he do? He opened up all the windows. Everybody could see. In fact, his, his, the ones who were out to get him saw it, and they were able to accuse Daniel of, of breaking the law. And so it was, because it was a law that was established Nebuchadnezzar um, relented and reluctantly sent Daniel to, to uh, the lion's den. Um, and as we see in uh, verse, chapter 6, verse 22, My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouths that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him innocency was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. So as it's interesting, the, when Daniel was put in the lion's den, the very next day, as early as he could, King Nebuchadnezzar went to check on him. I keep on saying, it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar, it was the king of the Medes and Persians. Okay, so that wasn't Nebuchadnezzar. This, this is after, after the fall of, of Babylon to the Medes and the Persians. Hmm? Darius the Mede? Yeah. And uh, so as, as, as he, went to, he went to check out on him immediately, and so Daniel said, the angel of the Lord, he shut the mouths of his lion. 
Now that's nothing like killing 885,000 men of war. It's nothing like spreading, killing 70,000 in a pestilence. But it certainly is powerful as you think about shutting the, the mouth of this lion. However, he did it, but it, it, it saved the life of Daniel. And so he was protected. So we see the power of angels once more. But note, the point here is angels have superhuman power. And we've seen that in, in the Old Testament accounts, historical events. And, uh, but yet, when it came to a point, God said, that's enough, no more. And the angel obeyed the will of the Lord. So that, whereas as God is omnipotent, angels are powerful, but not omnipotent. There's a limit to their power. Okay. Angels are free moral agents. As we, as we continue to consider the nature of angels, we see that, that angels have superhuman knowledge, but they are not, not omniscient. We see that angels have superhuman mobility, but they are not omnipresent. And angels have superhuman uh, power, but they're not omnipotent. Okay, so the distinguishing between the God and the angels. Okay, so angels are free moral agents. If we understand that we're free moral agents, we, ha we have a choice that God allows us to make. And so everybody's going to do exactly what they want to do. You have those that hear the word and they receive it gladly and they respond in obedience to find everlasting life. But they had that choice, just as everyone else. Well, they, hear, they can hear the gospel, and they either accept it or reject it. They have that free moral agency. They can choose. Look at 2 Peter chapter 2. 2 Peter chapter 2. Uh, as we look at uh, verse 4. To whom coming at, uh, let's see here. Let's begin in verse 1, because that introduces the whole thought. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby, if so be that ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. And you know what? Am I reading? I'm reading from 1 Peter. I meant 2 Peter. I apologize for that. 2 Peter chapter 2. Well, let's begin in verse 1 again. So let's erase that thought I just put in your mind regarding, uh, as we continue with the, the angels that are, that are free moral agents. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false pro uh, teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that brought, bought, bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. And many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. And through covetousness shall they be with feigned words make merchandise of you, whose judgment now of a long time lingereth not, and their damnation slumbereth not. For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment and spared not the old world but saved Noah and the eight person, the preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into the ashes condemneth them with an over, overthrow, making them an ensample unto those that after should live ungodly and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked for that righteous man dwelled dwelling among them and seeing and hearing vexes his righteous soul from day to day and their unlawful deeds, the Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. And that was the point of all that long introduction about how God is able, God, uh, Paul, Peter rather, gave examples of how God knows how to punish the evil and also deliver the righteous, okay. And so as, he, as Peter is discussing those false teachers that will draw many people away from the truth and many will, people will follow their pernicious ways and because of that following the, the, the way of truth should be evil spoken of, we know that when you see Christians living a hypo, hypocritical life, doesn't that bring reproach upon the church, upon Christ himself? And so in that, 
that God has reserved those, they'll receive their reward. They'll be damned. They'll be judged because of that. The, 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 the false teachers and those that believe and follow after that false teaching. They will be condemned. And as proof, look at the Old Testament. Look at the examples, some of which we looked at. Sodom and Gomorrah. God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, but delivered Lot. God destroyed the world of the flood, but delivered Noah. All these examples how God knows how to deliver the righteous and, and judge and punish the evil. But as he makes this point in verse 4, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be received into judgment, and he did. So what do we, what do we garner from this? Well, the angels, they made a choice. Some chose to sin along with Satan. Satan himself being an, an angel, we'll see that later on. So these angels made a choice to rebel against God, and God didn't spare them. Rather, God bound them in chains, sent them down to hell. Okay. But the thing is, they made a choice. They were free to make that choice. But there were consequences of that choice, and it was being cast down into hell. They'll spend everlasting eternity there with, with Satan and those of the human race who reject Christ and reject God, who has sinned. Okay. But the, the point here, angels are free moral agents. Look at Jude verses 5 and 6. Okay, and as Jude is writing, he writes in verse 5, I will, therefore, put you in remembrance, though ye once knew this, how that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. You recall when they, there was a rebellion, like 3,000 souls, people were dropped into the, the, the crevices that opened up, the earth opened up, swallowed 3,000 people who rebelled against Moses. Okay, and so... We see that the Lord, the Lord having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed them that believed not. What does that mean about uh, today? Are there Christians who once believed, obeyed, and they start to begin the, the walk in the light, but then later depart from that? There are, aren't there? What's going to be there in? Just like those in Israel who rebelled against Moses, they lost their lives. And so it is today. Those who rebelled against Christ after having been delivered from the, the bondage of sin, they'll, be, they'll lose their life, their soul as well. Okay, in verse 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, their first estate, there was a place that the angels held. The angels had a place in God's universe. He created the angels for a purpose, and they were given a, a first estate. They were given a first place, but left their own habitation. He hath reserved an everlasting change under darkness under the judgment of the great day. So the angels made a choice. They left what God had created them to, to be. And because of that, He's reserved and ever, uh, hath reserved an everlasting chains under darkness in the judgment of the great day. Okay, so we, once again we see that angels had a place that God created them for and they left it. Okay, they have free moral agency. Look at, uh, so angels, <laughs> and interesting, angels can sin. You think about our man's greatest plight is sin. The whole reason Jesus died on the cross is because of man's sin. And it's interesting to think that whereas we are given a, a, a plan to save us, to justify us, not because we're so great, or not the great things that we've done, but rather because God loves us, having sin, nevertheless, God loves us. And so he gives us a way out, a way so that we don't suffer the consequences of our sins. But the angels... They don't have anything like what we have. It's, it's very, 
uh, thought-provoking, humbling to think about how much God loves us and given us so much uh, slack, as it were. Okay. So angels can sin. Or they can serve God, just like we can sin. Or we can serve God. They choose whom they will serve, either God or self. Okay. We'll stop there. They can serve whom their choice. Just like we search, select who we'll serve, we either serve God or mammon. We select. There are consequences to, to choosing the latter. And there are consequences to choosing the former. There are consequences to choosing to satisfy our appetites here on the earth, to enjoy sin for a season. It's not very short-lived. There are consequences to that. But there are consequences to finding life. There are consequences to obedience to the gospel living the way that Christ would have us to live. We, the consequence of that is the gift of God, everlasting life in our Savior, Jesus Christ. Just as there are consequences to the, to the angels making a choice to serve God or to serve themselves. And so, so angels have free moral agency, free moral choice like we have. We'll stop there. Next week we'll pick up on that angels are created beings. As we, as we um, uh, garner more from what the scriptures reveal to us. And I'll try to look more into uh, the activity of angels today. That might be for a more deeper study later on in the, in the, in the quarter. That's right. Mm-hmm. But they are still tempted by the lust of the eyes. Well, they don't have exactly have the lust of the flesh, do they? But the pride of life, primarily the pride of life. We'll see that Satan fell to the pride of life. Pride. Anyway, we'll cut, pick up next week with uh, the same that angels are created beings. Thank you for your questions and, and uh, attention and comments. See you. Oh, yes, Tina. Okay. Hebrews 13, the forms. Well, 13, too, we talked about entertaining angels on the earth. Okay. Yes, we will. But from the beginning of the angels, did they, did they have, have, have appear, you know, were they, were they? We'll look at different examples that it gives us. Yes. We'll look at how the angels did appear to, to men, you right. know, and. Like you had talked about, you know, mm-hmm. That's a good question, and, and we'll, we'll look at that. I'm not sure if it'll be, well, uh, yes, we can do, do that next week regarding how angels have appeared and how they, uh, and, and how they are able to appear.